on it, and, and they poured it, they placed him in a tomb like this. And, and the Roman soldiers, the Roman guards, uh, stood, uh, stood guard over that. They rolled a big stone over the opening so that Jesus' disciples wouldn't come and get his body and steal his body uh, out of the tomb. But uh, they stood, and, and they placed two centurions, one on each side, guard, guarding that tomb. But, and that's the biggest word in the English language, is it not? But, B-U-T. That wasn't the end of the story, was it? So you see at the bottom where it says number three, turn it that direction. And what you'll see is Jesus standing in front of that tomb and tell the story of how the angel came and how the angel rolled away that stone and how God raised his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead for you and for me. How that we do not worship a dead Savior, but we worship a living yeah. Savior who lives with the Father in heaven and lives in our lives as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ. That's how much God loved you. He died for you, but he didn't stay in the grave. God raised his son from the dead, and he is alive today. We worship a living Savior. And so turn it uh, in the direction it says number four, okay? And what you'll find is something that looks like this, a wooden cross. And you'll find light at the top, and you'll find a man standing at the bottom. And you can say that uh, at one time that man was me. And you can say to that person, if you've not professed Christ as your Savior, that's where you stand right now, at the foot of the cross. And all men and women are equal at the foot of the cross. Red and yellow, black and white. Doesn't matter what race, what nationality. It doesn't matter whether it's male or female. It doesn't matter whether we're rich or poor. We all stand in need of God's salvation, which he provides in Jesus Christ. And I tell them that Jesus said, For I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man. And I look at my friend that I'm talking to, and I say, Dear friend, that means you, and that means me. No man can come to God except through Jesus. And I'm saying that God is here, and we're down here. And the cross becomes the way, it becomes the bridge that we walk across in faith to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And I said, if you don't have faith, God will give you that faith. He tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that even the faith it takes to be saved is a gift of God. He gives us that faith. And so then I turn it to uh, in the direction that it says, the very next direction, which is, uh, what does it say, six or five? Five, okay? And it looks something like this. It has uh, heaven at the top, and it has hell at the bottom, or the fire at the bottom represents hell. That's what it is. And I say to this, my friend that I'm talking to, that uh, according to God's word, there are only two options of where we will spend eternity. We either spend eternity in hell, which is a reality. It's not a figment of someone's imagination. The Bible has more to say about hell than it does heaven, if you really want to know the truth. Billy Graham counted it, and, and he says it's true. I believe that's true. I haven't counted it, but he said it was, okay? That we either spend eternity in hell or in heaven with God. And I say to my friend, that this picture in the middle, which, which shows Jesus reaching down with a nail-pierced hand, that's what he did when he died on the cross for you and for me. He provided the way to salvation. I could not elevate myself to God's heaven, not by works, not good deeds, not because I was born into a Christian family, not through anything else other than the salvation, the free gift of God that he offered me, which was salvation. But Christ reaches down and he says, I am that way. Take my hand and let me show you 
how that you can become a Christian. And then I look at that person and I say to them, have you ever done that? Have you ever prayed a prayer where you confessed your sins to the Lord? Where you confessed that He was the Lord and Savior of the world? Where you ask Him to forgive you of your sins? Have you ever done it? You see, we can tell all the good stories in the world, but if we don't get to the point of asking someone, we'll never know. They may be ready. Now, you're not trying to pressure someone. There is a difference. Don't misunderstand me. This is not high-pressure evangelism. What we're looking for is the Spirit of God working in someone's life. We talked about that earlier. Drawing that person to himself, and you're telling the story visually. You know, there's something about today. People love visual stuff. It's not just kids that love it. It's kids my age that love it and relate to it as well. Visually, you're painting a picture of what Jesus did in your life if you're a Christian and what he wants to do in your friend's life. And you know, I was a salesman at one time, and they used to tell me that uh, it doesn't matter how good your product is. If you never ask someone, the answer is always no. Again, not trying to pressure someone. If the Spirit's not drawing them, it's not time. It, you don't want them to pray a false prayer. But you'll oftentimes find at this point that the Holy Spirit's already working in their heart. That the Holy Spirit's been using your story, your testimony, the scripture that you quoted. Been using the pictures that you have to reach down and draw that person that's in need of salvation to himself. And if they are, just simply lead them through that prayer. They may need help, as I said before, praying that prayer. You're a Christian. You know how to pray a prayer like that. No memorized prayer, doesn't matter what they say, but it's important that they pray and they confess their sins and they confess Christ as Savior and Lord and invite him into their heart to rule, to be their Savior and to be their Lord. That's very, very important for that person, okay? Then the next thing has us to turn this again. If they pray and do that, then look at the back and it looks something like this. It's got a heart right in the middle. And here's what you explain to that person, because you don't just leave someone who's just prayed a prayer like that. You want to help guide them in the right direction. First of all, we talk about the heart. You know, the first and great commandment of our Lord is to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. And he loves us. That's why he gave us Jesus. But we're to love him. And so the heart is the important beginning point for the new believer in Jesus Christ. They need to understand that that is a heart, was well, a heart decision they made, and that they walk with the Lord, committed to him uh, with a heart type, heartfelt commitment. Then I go to God's word, and I say to them, if they don't have a copy of a Bible, I, I usually have one of these New Testaments with me. And I give them a copy. I ask them, do you have a copy of God's Word? Because it's really going to be important that you begin, and I always encourage them to start with the Gospel of John or with Matthew or Mark. You don't want them to begin in Genesis, uh, probably if, they've not, if they're not familiar with Scripture. Genesis is a great book to read. Don't misunderstand, Kent. But I'm saying for the brand new believer in Jesus Christ, they need to begin with the gospel. They need to find out more about what Jesus did for them, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will tell them that. So get them started. Give them a Bible or encourage them every day to read one chapter, just one chapter a day to grow in the Lord. Then uh, over here to the left is someone kneeling in prayer. And I say to them, one thing you need to do uh, every day is to talk to God, to pray, to talk to God. That's what you tell them that that's what prayer is. You don't have to memorize a certain thing. You just talk to God every day. You tell him your needs. You tell him what is on your mind and heart, what you're concerned about. You ask him to use you as his witness to tell other people about this. Down below, at the hands of two people, shaking hands together, shows this down in the lower left-hand column. That represents the church, the fellowship, the body of Christ, because that's how we grow in the Lord. We come together and we learn from Bible study together, 
from body life together, how more mature Christians handle certain situations, and it rubs off on those who are brand new babes in Christ. And that's why the body life is important. It's also important that we can serve him through the body in whatever talents and gifts he's given to us. We talk about that. That a church is important, so you encourage them. You tell them, hey, you can go to church with me next Sunday if you'd like. I'll be glad to come by and pick you up. Maybe they're not used to going to church. Offer to help them go to church. And then over here,